<clears throat> boyos, boyos, how are you? Yes, okay. Today we're going to talk about one of my favorite chapters in all of Jung's work. Now, this is going to take a slightly different form than usual. There's going to be a reading from the archetypes of the collective unconscious for about 10 minutes. And this will be one that won't be as good if you just podcast it. It'll actually be a lot better if you take some time to watch because Jung provides pictures. And then we're going to go kind of left field and I'm going to do an interview with an artist afterwards. And we are again going to go through some of his paintings and watch how he went through the same process or similar enough process as to what was going on with the character that Jung is talking about in this excerpt. So I know that you want me to again put up the PowerPoint slides and rant about Rome and the Reconquista, but it probably won't be happening today. Today will be a lot more about art and looking at paintings and this type of vibe. This will be experimental and I hope you enjoy and stay fucking juicy. Here we go. A study in the process of individuation. During the 1920s, I made acquaintance in America of a lady with an academic education. We will call her Mrs. X who had studied psychology for nine years. She had read all the more recent literature in the field. In 1928, at the age of 55, she came to Europe in order to continue her studies under my guidance. As the daughter of an exceptional father, she had varied interests, was extremely cultured, and possessed a lively turn of mind. She was unmarried but lived with the unconscious equivalent of a human partner, namely the animus, a situation that often occurs with academic women. As frequently happens, this was based on a positive father complex. She was daddy's little angel, but consequently did not have a good relationship to her mother. Now, her animus was not the kind to give her cranky ideas. She was protected from this by her natural intelligence, by a remarkable readiness to tolerate the opinions of other people. This good quality, by no means to be expected in the presence of an animus, had, in conjunction with some difficult experiences, enabled her to realize she had gotten stuck. This was one of her reasons for her trip to Europe. Associated with this, there was another, not accidental, motive. On her mother's side, she was of Scandinavian descent. Since her relation to her mother left very much to be desired, as she herself certainly realized, the feeling had gradually grown on her that this side of her nature might have developed differently. If only the relation to her mother had given it a chance. Before coming to Switzerland, she had gone back to Denmark, her mother's country. There, the thing that affected her the most was the landscape. And strangely, she was overcome by the desire to paint. You see, she didn't know how to paint or draw. But she tried her hand at watercolors and her modest landscapes filled her with a strange feeling of contentment. Painting them, she told me, seemed to fill her with new life. Arriving in Zurich, she continued her painting efforts, and on the day before she came to me for the first time, she began another landscape. This time from memory. While she was working on it, a fantasy image suddenly thrust itself between her and the picture. She saw herself with the lower half of her body in the earth, stuck fast in a block of rock. She felt caught and helpless. She then suddenly saw me in the guise of a medieval sorcerer. She shouted for help, and I came along and touched the rock with my magic wand. The stone instantly burst open, and she stepped out uninjured. She then painted this fantasy image instead of the landscape and brought it to me on the following day.
As usually happens with beginners and people with no skill of hand, the drawing of the picture cost her considerable difficulties. In such cases, it is very easy for the unconscious to slip its subliminal images into the painting. This picture shows first of all her imprisoned state, but not yet the act of liberation. Miss X had discovered all by herself the method of active imagination that I have been long accustomed to. And I was able to approach the problem at just the point indicated by the picture. She is caught in the unconscious and expects magical help from me as a sorcerer. She did not want to know how liberation might be possible in a general way but how it would come about for her. And about this I knew as little as she. So I counseled her to content herself with what was possible and to use her fantasy for the purpose of circumventing technical difficulties. I also advised her not to shy away from bright colors, for I knew from experience that vivid colors seemed to attract the unconscious. Thereupon, a new picture arose. While Miss X was painting this picture, she made all sorts of discoveries. Above all, she had no notion of what picture she was going to paint. She tried to reimagine the initial situation, the rocky shore, and the sea, but the eggs turned into abstract spheres or circles and the magician's touch became a flash of lightning cutting through her unconscious state. I didn't tell her this. I didn't want to interrupt. I didn't want to impose my knowledge on a natural process. But she had touched into the ancient conception of the philosopher's egg, the alchemical philosopher's stone. Now the form of this picture did not go down well with the patient's conscious mind. Luckily, however, while painting it, Miss X had discovered that two factors were involved. These, in her own words, were reason and the eyes. Reason always wanted to make the picture as it thought it ought to be. But the eyes held fast to their vision, their inner fantasy and finally forced the picture to come out as it actually did, and not in accordance with rationalistic expectations. Her reason, she said, had really intended a daylight scene, with the sunshine melting the sphere free, but the eyes favoured a nocturne with shattering, dangerous lightning. This realisation helped her to acknowledge the actual results of her artistic efforts and to admit that it was in fact an objective and impersonal process, and not a personal relationship. Her interpretation of the lightning was, much to my agreement, a flash of intuition. This was brilliantly archetypal. Like lightning coming from a thunderstorm, intuition comes from somewhere outside the ego. Like Yahweh, like Zeus, the spirit of thunder, they strike the ego with lightning, breaking it like an eggshell. They strike and animate the sleeping, greater version of yourself who is trapped in stone, the more complete personality. This is the self. This self was always present, but sleeping, like Nietzsche's image in the stone. It is the philosopher's stone, and what sleeps in it is the spirit of Mercury, the original man, the great being within. Michelangelo may have experienced this when he was crafting the statue of David. He frantically worked in secret and when asked afterwards said that he saw an angel trapped inside the block of stone and it became of primary importance that he frees it. Now, I did not tell our patient any of this. In truth, I did not really know any of this. You see, her third picture is what inspired me to make a serious study of alchemy. 
While Miss X was painting this picture, she felt that two earlier dreams were mingling with her vision. They were the two big dreams of her life. The first was of the world, which always appeared as a globe getting divided into combinations of twelve. The second, she saw a golden snake in the sky demanding sacrifice from among a great crowd of people. The man who obeyed this command stood up from the crowd with an expression of sorrow. Now, it has to be emphasized, this patient felt that the painting of this picture was the climax of her life. I began to understand that this sphere was the taking off of the self. The following pictures began to take the forms of mandalas as her deeper unconscious expressed itself onto these ordered circles. The ritual of drawing mandalas is extremely common in Eastern religions. It forms as a focal point to concentrate the mind. One of the most incredible versions of this is where Buddhist monks drop one grain of sand at a time to create huge and elaborate mandalas of almost glorious perfection. Yet the second they are finished, they are told to completely destroy it by blowing it all away. So ladies and boyomen, boyos and boyettes, I know that you probably are foaming at the mat with the juiciness. You don't need any explanation. It probably just hits you in your astral soul and you're, you're vibrating existentially being like, it all makes sense now. But I will explain to you why I like this chapter so much, why I'm into it so much. And it all hinges on the fundamental principle, the fundamental cliche of take action over theory, practice over over theory. The reason why I like this is because Jung is littered full of uh, complex jargon and it's very, very academic, very, very head heavy and very, very dense to read. But this particular chapter is the antithesis to all this because it is a presentation by Jung of an empirical uh, discussion about the individuation process, the crux of his entire philosophy, if you will, or his entire outlook, if you will. And he shows how it happened to someone. And it's an, an amazing, amazing description of how it happened because it, it sort of captures the essence of what goes wrong with academics. This is, you know, being us being people in the abstract world of ideas and, and, and intellectuals and all this, we're supposed to flatter each other and be like, oh, we're the smart ones. All those working class plebs who don't read books, they're actually below us because we're the ones who are conscious and know what's going on. But of course... We, in some sense, are just drug addicts to abstractions. We like to suckle on the tit of abstract thought and intellectual stuff and, and, and allow it to flatter us with this, this horrific pride. But as, of course, Jung would say, if you're, you're thinking orientated, if you're, you're caught in abstractions, you're probably denying something more fundamental, which is your feeling or your body even. Now, this, this archetype of the stiff information guy is a very actual pathetic one. It's, it's something that is not, not very good. It's, 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 a, it's a very out of touch, um, s shallow way of living. It's, as we said, stuck in your head, cut off from the body and whatnot. Now, obviously, the body is, is stupid and, and hard to lead and, you know, Dionysian but not Apollyan. It can't see what's going on. So you want these two things to be firing on all cylinders together and working together. And what particularly happens when you're just firing from your head and specifically your left brain, you get this um, get this character, this sterile way of living, you know? You get this sterile way of living where you're you're out of touch and you're not able to do anything. You're you're lost, as I said, in this in this 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 opium room of of abstract concepts and you're trying to parse them out and, and thinking that you're making some sort of progress by by walking through this fog and this cloud of ideas and being like there's I understand what an archetype is I understand what the shadow is I've integrated my anima I've integrated my opposites I am complete but of course you're only necessarily complete in the fact that you're building a really nice castle inside your mind but the problem is that the part of your mind you're building that in this ego this little conceptual space this left brain this ego this little you know playpen that you've that you've got inside your head where you're building this castle is tiny compared to the immense grandeur and power of the world. 
And this is where the unconscious lives. It lives outside the ego. It lives in the right brain. You want to get there. You want to build your castle in relationship with this thing. But we all obviously make this mistake of, of, of grabbing our jargon and putting together this little egoic palace where we can be king where we can stand up and we can look at all those working class plebs who don't read books and be like you're pathetic i am better than you because i have a castle in my mind when i throw my jargon at you and you you kind of get turned off and you're kind of like this this is this is kind of annoying stop doing this well you can just say well it's because you're ignorant it's because you're 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 poorly led read it's because you're you're driven by your instincts and you know perhaps there's something to that but there's not as much to it as you think perhaps there's something to the opposite perhaps there's something to the reverence of your instincts and of course when you see this character that young finds in this brilliant brilliant chapter a woman who is out of touch with her instincts a animus infected woman if you will and she is old and she is not married and i assume she doesn't have children and so you get this kind of sad thing and look i'm not here to bash the girls but it is something to kind of warn and worry yourself about is that like you know you're into the intellectual stuff you're a thinker you're you're up in your head you're you're like they would call it neurotic and um, there's 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 a really dark side to the 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 pleasure the addiction to abstraction the the addiction to the the world of ideas and that is the sterility of it you know think of the priestly cast the you know the castrated sterile thinking cast the brahmin cast the, the the type of person who gets absorbed in ideas they they leave the body because the body is is a prison that holds them back from their vivid vivid imagination or their vivid world of concepts but of course if this happens to you you might in order to conquer your instincts might destroy the one thing that will derive all your meaning and purpose in your life the instincts are not stupid their their insistence that you uh, achieve a the 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 basics of life such as perhaps children or a future or 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 engagement with life you know these type of things experiences these type of things this is um not trivial not stuff you can specifically dismiss and and so she was the type and she was chirpy and quirky you know the type like kind of cool kind of like uh funny maybe maybe smart um auntie or something like that you know but she she might she might have been haunted by a subtle loneliness or a kind of confusion it's like where's my path and and young takes this woman and and you know you can kind of lambast her and be like you should get married and all that but that's not going to work it's not it's not going to work if you just turn around and 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 try to scold someone for for something that they am so what you need to do is you need to think about well how can i get her in touch with a fertile living part of herself you know so she's got this little ego that she's built up this this palace of concepts and she's reached a point in her life where she's like i i, I don't want the jargon anymore i want to know i want to do it i want to do the procedure and so what young does is he he actually in some sense he actually just gets out of the way of this whole process he acts as this subtle guide more than the the master plan dude he acts as this subtle guide and gently nudges her in the right direction and i've i've done um i'm working with people now like i'm doing i'm working with clients and this is a professional thing for me now and i've noticed that so often that is actually the graceful touch you have to get you have to kind of step out of the way and just nudge people in the right direction and that can make all the difference you know and so this is what he sort of does. He sort of pushes her towards painting, which is, she is doing quite naturally. And he, he sort of helps her process what's going on. And so she comes at him and she's like, okay, I've got these two parts of my mind, reason and the eyes. And of course, on this channel, we love, love the left brain, right brain dynamic. And this falls too conveniently into it. When I read this recently in order to do this video, I was like, I was like shuddering. I was like, I felt like in my soul, I was screaming, yes, 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 Carol. Yes, you are. Yes, Carol. Yes. I wanted to, I wanted to send up my spirit to, to Carlos and be like, you fucking yes, Carol. Good man. 10 out of 10, Carol. Five stars on this page here, Carol. Good fucking job. And, and this is, this is exactly it. It's, it's this, um, the, the validation, the neuroscience backs up Carl. Carl was right. All of you were wrong. Carl was right. And um, all those Richard Dawkins are going to get you. Sam Harris are going to get you. Carl was right, man. <laughs> um, the 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 reasonable left brain its job is to take reality lie about it and make it functional and it does this through reason and abstractions and jargon and it's the ego and we often get so 
tragically caught up in that and we get trapped in this prison and what what's so weird about it as i said we build this palace of concepts in our mind this way of seeing the world in our mind and on what becomes the 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 the, the glue the concrete that holds together this worldview is often our, our concepts our jargon our bullshit our patterns whatever i've talked about this at length now you have this other part of your mind. Now, the science on this is is fascinating because it actually begins to show that the, the right brain is literally a separate consciousness. You know, it's a separate presence. It, it actually thinks and sees things differently. And but it's quiet. It doesn't really have a voice. So the sort of left brain has a voice and it does all this bladdering and all this stuff. And it, it very similar looks very close to the ego. Whereas the right brain doesn't. The, the right brain kind of chills and 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 watches what the left brain does and understands why it's doing it, uh, but doesn't interrupt for some reason unless it really thinks it's necessary and just lets it do it. I, I again. Um, I think it's CPS Grey, you are too. I highly recommend you watch that video. Maybe we'll watch it someday, actually. And we'll, we'll discuss all this stuff going on. But it, it explains it perfectly. The right brain is this separate consciousness, you know? And this is so close to her conceptualization of what's going on. She says the eyes. You know, the, the, the second way of seeing things. Brilliant. Brilliant. Because that's exactly what it's like. It's it's like you've got this other channel, you know. You can think of it like a radio signal. Your focus goes towards. So this is, again, I've, I've talked about this in a lot of these things. Your mind has almost got like three things going on. You've got this weird focus. And then you've got like uh, you've got like the, the thinking left brain. And then there's this other part of your mind that your focus can pay attention to otherwise, which is where your dreams come from at night. You know, when you go sleep and the, the, the ego turns off. But your dreams come. Where do where do dreams coming from, bro? Are they are they just like you know? Are they just floating out? Is the ego suddenly turned into a musician in the middle? No, they're coming from somewhere else, and it's almost like a different channel. So you're tuning the radio into a different channel, the other side, and this actually is the creative, fertile one. This is as I've said before. It's like if you ha own a garden. And you have this like elaborate master plan, and you're like cutting everything up, and you're you're throwing all this fertilizer onto the garden, and you're you're too caught up with like re reading all the internet and, go, and getting all the high tech. You'd probably be better off just, you know, throwing some seeds there and and walking away, and maybe coming back and weeding it once or twice, and making sure it gets water, and just letting it do its work. It would naturally heal, you know. Let it naturally heal. Let it solve its own problem. But we we get in the way of this thing. And there's a part of us in our mind, there's a part of our mind that is naturally fertile, like the garden. It grows naturally. That's where the dreams come from. You don't have to make dreams. You don't have to do anything. The dreams will naturally give you stuff. Every night you'll have a little movie in your head. And you don't need to, you don't need to pay for it. You don't need none of that stuff. It'll just come to you. You know? And it's not stupid either. Just like nature's not stupid. Just like when the garden grows, it's not dumb. The garden doesn't grow and like and, and shout every morning and be like, yo, which way do we go, man? <laughs> where's where's the sun? Like, where's do we go left or do we go right or do we go up? Should I be a Republican or Democrat? How does that work? How do I integrate my shadow there? <laughs> <laughs> like these big the cabbages and be like how i i feel like um i've i've got a problem with my anima like <laughs> it never does that what it does is it, it just instinctively reaches towards the sun it reaches towards the upper correct thing it's it's seeking to do something very simple it's seeking to claim its space in the sun and then blossom and that is the path, path of life and um in some sense, this happens to you as well. You know, the dreams just grow. They, they're like the instinct speaking. They just grow. And as Jung said, they, they, they actually are naturally presenting you the way to go. It's like you're programmed. You know, you've, you've got a, an operating system and it's running naturally. And your ego is something kind of fragmented off that thing. And it's useful. It, there's a reason why we have it. But it's not necessarily all consuming and perfect. Um, it's got problems. It's got flaws. And it's, it's a relationship you need to build. And it can, it can sterilize you if you're not careful. And so what what I guess a note on that as well is that like the, the, the frontal cortex, the thing that makes the human mind so supreme over the animal mind is that it's got this ability to 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 inhibit, to stop. All right. So it's got this ability to hold back impulse. So it's its ability to conquer impulse. And you can think about that. That's like a, a it's like a murderous thing. It, it kills the, the, the firing neurons, the electri electrical surge. It kills the energy still. So that it can do things that are supreme, like, you know, hold your tongue, not say what you think, manipulate people, and go quiet, make plans, 
um, act on act on reason as opposed to impulse, see the future, these type of things. These are all incredibly important things, but they, they involve a a silencing, a a murdering of of energy, a a, a a a a a grip of energy. Now, if this 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 reasoning, this inhibiting mind, is able to get too strong, it can completely kill everything off. You know, it's sort of like what's happened here, where the inhibiting frontal cortex. Uh, in its glory, it took over the world, but then at some point it starts to turn on itself. It starts to inhibit all sources of instincts and it, it forms us a sort of ideology where it's like, we must, dreams are energy, we must kill them inside of us. Nothing irrational and superstitious must exist, we must kill everything. And that's a sterilizing, murdering effect. It's killing life. Whereas, as I said, life that grows in you through your dreams, your instincts inside of you, these impulses, they're good. They're good, but it's a relationship thing. You need to guide them like a horse. It's not this black and white thinking, which is pretty much what everybody does. This is why nobody should be allowed to talk except for me and Carol. <laughs> and then maybe Nietzsche. We'll give those three. <laughs> but um, you, you see all this. You, you see where I'm getting at here. And, and of course, Jung notices the, this with this woman. She's naturally coming to that point. She's, she, she's naturally being like, I hate jar I'm a jargon junkie. I don't want it anymore. I don't like, I don't want to know in a general sense, left brain loves generalities, right brain loves specifics. I don't want to know the general stuff. I don't want to know about individuation anymore. I don't care. I've learned it all. I don't care anymore. I want it to happen to me. I want to go through the experience. I want to know myself. I want to feel it. I want to be through it. I want to live, you know. I don't want to read about your dreams. I don't want to read about your patient's dreams. I don't want to read about the, the, the great dreams of my culture. I want to go through it myself. I want to find it in myself. And so she does the painting and essentially forms an art therapy thing. And Carl is like, yes, yes, okay. Yes, okay. And um, my magic wand, touch, boom. And she starts to paint. And she, she learns to tune into this set of eyes, the inner eye. The, the same place the dreams come from, you know, this, this sort of, the, the, the way your mind would know that it wants a dream. It's looking for this other thing. And she, she gives herself over to this. And this is amazing. This is like um, the inhibiting mind, the ego, the thing that holds everything back, turns off and lets this other part of her mind come out. And, and, and that's amazing. It's like, it's like inhibiting yourself from inhibiting yourself, you know. It's stopping yourself from trying to stop yourself, do everything. And so she she experiences this 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 vivid um, explosion of ideas, this vivid explosion of of energy. She she experiences like a a spiritual climax at the point where she's drawing the third picture because it's you know she's this these impulses, these deep instincts that have been crushed by her academic ego are finally bursting themselves out and allowing uh, they're being permitted to talk. And so think about what's going on here. It's like she's sitting there and she's like blasting. Her, her, her libidinous impulses, her spiritual impulses into canvas. And, and think about what this says about what a human is. You know, you've got this inhibiting ego left brain. And that's the thing we sort of use to carry us around in the world. And it's the neurotic thing that fills us full of anxiety. It does definitely help us, but it's it's got downsides. And, and this is what we kind of think that we are. And we think that this is the source of all creativity, where its only real strength is sterilization. All it can really do is, is, is silence, is stop things. It's an energy killer, not an energy creator. We're always looking for sustenance, creativity, life. We get lost in this complex world of abstractions, thinking we're looking for um, you know, balanced morality and everyone not to be a hypocrite and all that. But no, no, what we're looking for is life. Actually, people's hypocrisy is probably one of the funniest and most enjoyable things about being alive. Uh, you, we often joke about our own hypocrisy, you know? And what we're looking for is that hypocrisy. What we're looking for is life. We want to be alive. And so she she discovers this. And the, the way you discover this is by realizing that there is a part of you that is alive. It's like a, as I said, it's like a radio show that naturally plays in your head. The right-brained radio show. <laughs> The right brain radio show is like blasting out all its this energy, you know, all the good vibes, blasting out all the cool movies. It's like Hollywood. You know, you tune yourself into into Twitter and into the news channels and you'll get caught up in that world. And you'll, your, your, your world will be shaped by that and you'll, you'll get caught up talking about all, all this type of stuff. But the Hollywood will meanwhile be churning out or Netflix will be churning out all the movies. And if you actually just tune over to the movies, you can have a whole different experience by paying attention to them. That, tune over to that other radio channel. And then you kind of ask yourself, it's like, wait a second, like, I'm not making any of these movies. They're just coming to me. Where are they coming from? It's like you're a little, like, radio thing or, I don't know, a, a phone or something. You're like this piece of technology and you're, like, receiving signals. 
You know, you're not actually doing anything. You're receiving signals. Like in the left brain, it receives signals from the outside world. This right brain seems to receive signals from the inside world. What the f is that all about? What the hell is going on there? That is some wild stuff. Why is that happening? Who's sending me signals? Who's sending me the dreams? Wh and, and then this is the scary thing. Why are they ordered? Why do they have the archetypes? Why do they speak in archetypes that make sense? Why, why does that happen? I don't understand what's going on here. Now, I'll let you into uh, on a little secret. There's, there's many possibilities. Some could say it's, it's the voice of, it's God who's guiding these. You know, he's guiding you through the symbols. God is speaking to you through your right brain and you've tuned him out because you're arrogant enough to think that your left brain is superior and that's why you're in pain and that's why society's going to crap. It's your fault. And that is one. You could say the uh, he, he, God lives at the very bottom of the unconscious is one thing. Now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to suggest another. You may have seen recently that the Pentagon announced that the they've discovered or they have they have documents they've they've disclosed that off-world vehicles exist, and you see, perhaps I'm not saying I know anything, not saying I'm clued in to things that other people don't know, but perhaps there is an off-world vehicle, and he sends it's it's led by this great being who who has a, a transmission because you know look I've I've. I've listened to my right brain, and this is sort of what I get. I get this transmission, this this hint from this great being, this great man, that um, the world is possessed by the demiurge, and it, and this guy says that he actually came here before to try expose this, this alien from outer space on his off-world spaceship. He said he came here to, before to try expose this, and he said that the time is coming now where he's he's thinking about returning. In fact. We're at the point now where he says the left brain tyranny of the Demiurg. The Demiurg uses the left brain. You think, right, you create that castle in your mind. The Demiurg cr is creating all of humanity in a giant egotistical left brain sterile castle where it will consume all of humanity into its own will and then destroy everything like an entropic beast that it is. And of course, we're, we're all stuck up in this tragedy. But of course, there's the, the being of ultimate light, ultimate life who lives in the off-world vehicle and he's sending us these transmissions and just when you tune into them you realize this is where they come from this is what they're trying to say they're like this demiurge is out there i've been here before and i'm coming back again and i'm just looking for people who can who can defeat that ego in themselves and and connect with the right brain i'm looking for these people because i'm recruiting an army i'm recruiting an astral army of juicy boils so if you tune into the right brain, God knows you might you might receive a transmission, you might receive a, a application form from the other world, from the alien. A very specific one. But who knows? It's not that I know about anything about these things. Um, I'm just a boil. Nonetheless, it, it opens up a very, very confusing and interesting thing. It's like, where does this stuff out of the right brain come? And of course, I need some scientific credibility around here. So I don't know. It probably comes from uh, evolutionary patterns and instincts that have been built into you. There you go. There's a nice little there's a nice little uh, table talk one you can go for. Nonetheless, it, it's ordered. And that's what's so fascinating about it. Dreams have a cer certain order to them, just like plants have a certain order to them when they grow. And you like no, the plant doesn't have an ego. It just does what it does. So life is a certain order to it. It is a logos, if you will. And you are in the same position where you have this 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 natural, naturally growing part of yourself, and you just need to let it out. And when you let it out, it it formulates itself into what Jung notices similar patterns to how alchemy went through, similar patterns to religion and whatnot. You you find the archetypes. The archetypes are th this. This order, this divine thing speaks in archetypes. You can think of a plant trying to grow. It sees itself in its soul. It feels itself needing to fit a certain shape. And that is like the, the plant's set of archetypes. And its job isn't to kind of figure out, be like, if rationally I understand that I must, be, I must become the plant. It's more like it actually has to do the thing. It has to actually become the plant. It actually, actually has to go through that. And so the process is what matters. And this is the same for you. You, you are being... Inside of you, deep in your right brain, there's this consciousness, this, and, and as we said, it's like sort of scientific now that there's a second consciousness there. And this perspective, this right brain knows that this, that what you've got to be is the greater version of yourself, the juicier, fuller conception of yourself, the, the greater personality. And so it injects you with energy to try to lead you in that direction. And your, your, your sterilizing ego kills that energy off because it thinks it knows better. And that's okay generally until sometimes when the right brain gets pissed off. And so what it does is it shoots a flash of lightning that snaps the ego out of its bullshit and lets it see who's what's really the project that's going on.
and that empowers you and fills you full of juice. And so I've always loved this chapter as a demonstration of that, a demonstration of the natural power and energy inside your mind, the natural fertility in your mind. When I was a young uh, kid growing up, I often had so many struggles with thinking like how... How will I be creative? How will I be myself? You know, how will I, cre- I want to create cool things. I want to be an Uber wrench. I want to create cool things. But how do I do it? I'd sit down. I've told you about this before. I'd sit down and I'd try and make music by organizing all the genres together and making my own genre and all this stuff. And what I really needed to do was actually get out of my own way. And when I read this chapter, I clutched onto it so tightly because it was like, you don't need to do anything. You actually need to take the the, the role more of like a, 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 a radio tuner, a channeler, a channeler, you know? And and that's actually quite accurate. That's That's like really really close to when i talk to an artist who's doing well what they start to feel they develop this this sort of uh old, the old conception of the muse starts to make sense they feel like they're 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 finding a, a different channel like, and it's often a feminine channel maybe this is why young used the concept of the anima this feminine channel and they're allowing it to release the energy out into into them through them if you will through them if you will and that type of idea, you're looking for this type of thing. You're, you're looking to let the instinct speak through you. As we said, it's like a horse. You want to like control the horse, ride on the horse, inhibit it when you think it needs to be inhibited, but you're fundamentally letting it run. You're not cutting its legs off and thinking you're some genius because you know, you've, you've, you're, you're a moral person because you've castrated your horse and cut its legs off. That's not, that's not an, an accurate way of seeing things. And so this is a um, really important thing to understand. I think it is brilliant i think it's full of immense potent juice and uh now i'm going to i'm going to lead you into a discussion a, a, a sort of more more of a exposition on all of this i'm going to show you a conversation i had with a juicy german artist named malta he's a fantastic artist and he was someone who just started painting he just started like with, with psychedelics and he had like emotional troubles and all this. He he just started getting into painting, he started going all forward and, and letting this part of himself talk in some sense. And what we what what we began talking, like when he started finding mind stuff and a little bit before that he started getting into young. And then he started to look back through his paintings and realize that there was a certain there's there, the, it was speaking about him. It was talking, you know, it was intelligent. He might have, he sort of saw the paintings as a little bit numb and, and just, there's just sort of paintings, like they look cool. But when he looked back over them, he saw them as, the, as full of these big archetypical motifs that were moving him forward throughout his life. And that becomes an immense, immense, immensely interesting thing for a person because something comes out of you and you study it and it's like a story more sophisticated than anything you could ever create with your sterile left brain. A story about you. You know, and if you do it well, it, it brings you this great peace. He, he says that, uh, he was telling me before, and I, I remember this uh, my, uh, saying it happens to me too sometimes, where you sit down with something you make and you, you like he would stare at the painting for a while and I would sit down sometimes and listen to a song I'd make and it kind of brings you this weird peace. It's like, it's like you're hearing a reflection of something that was in you, now outside of you. It's a very, very strange feeling, but it's a fundamentally good feeling. And so this is what we're going to talk about here. So, my man, um, you were, well, I guess we'll have to start with the, the heavy, dark stuff, if you wish. And um, you, were, you were struggling as you were growing up, as we all tend to do. It's, it's quite a strange one. You were going through a, a crisis. You're going through a tough time. And a big changing point in your life was um, when you, you had a psychedelic trip. But before that, you told me some amazing things. And if you don't mind me mentioning it, like one of the most interesting things you told me and <laughs> maybe that's the wrong adjective but was uh you you planned your own suicide could you tell us about that a little bit uh yeah sure so at the time i felt really empty um i guess many people go to depression at that age or a soft depression um and for me it's felt like um yeah, there, there was there was no point in living for me, mm-hmm. um, but I wanted I actually wanted to have death kind of as an art as a piece of art. Mm-hmm. Um, so I planned how to how I would do my suicide. Um, so I had this this idea of uh, hanging from the ceiling at a certain point at our home home, uh, painting the whole ground uh, beneath it in black, and having a body paint that went from um, the normal normal skin color to very dark at the bottom of my feet so there was kind of a uh, 
what's the name for it? Um, a, a fusion of the two, yeah, of the yeah. ground and uh, and the body. Um, and I was 18 at the time where I had this this idea um, and thought about these things. Um, and I've also that that was one of the points I started to to actually train because I was pretty uh, pretty fat at the at the time. Um, so I wanted to this whole thing to look good, uh, which was one of the reasons I actually started to started to do the sports. Um, <laughs> that is, I know that is one of the best motivations for sports I've ever heard in my life. I wanted I wanted to look good for this very specific Air Force. <laughs> Um, and and you've you've heard my thoughts on this before. Like I I, I think um, suicide's a fascinating thing, and like that's again I'm using the worst adjectives ever. I'm supposed to come at this with gravitas, but it is a sort of fascinating thing in that um, it's often tied to this idea that I I don't like myself. And when you think about it more and more and more, and you go with this idea that all your emotions, in some level, are trying to help you a little bit. You know, the idea of destroy yourself. If you take take that actually to its logical conclusion, that's actually what exactly what you want. You know, you don't like yourself and you want to transform. And so something like um, destroying your destroying your mind, taking your life, and all that. That's that's the ultimate form of transformation. That's the ultimate transition into a new level. It's it's an ultimate um, overcoming of of the disaster that you are. And obviously, in the extreme sense, what, what I noticed when I had feelings like this, because I've had feelings like this loads of times, is that you, you, you have this feeling of disempoweredness. You say to yourself, I'm never going to make it. it. Everything is too hard. It's never, like, there's this fatalism. And things are never going to change. So I should just give up now because in the future, it will be harder and harder and harder. And nothing is ever going to get better and whatnot. And then, and then that forces you to a, a decision point where obviously one of them is the gun or the, the, the very well painted uh, hanging from the ceiling or something like that. Whereas the other would be um, actually to just completely abandon everything you're doing and go in a different direction and whatnot. And this is really, really hard to make. It, it, it's, it's almost impossible to make a conscious decision to do this. And because, you know, our egos are just too strong. We're too stuck in our ways. I talked about this in the last Red Book thing. We're too caught up in our dopamine patterns. But um, the, the interesting thing then is as I'm trying to describe in this, this Carl Jung and the collective um, archetypes, the collective unconscious, you, you look at the way that he, the, the mind is, has got this hidden intelligence to it, you know, and this is again, not a trivial thing. If you let it talk, it's able to order um, a page for you in such a sense that it will start presenting you actually like stuff that's beautiful, beautiful enough to be like high art is what I think that woman produced. And then you think about that, like this, this energy, this, 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 this deep mind, is, is projecting that into your life all the time. It never goes away. You know, this is what Jung would perhaps call the self. It never goes away. It's projecting that energy into your mind all the time. And so when it's demanding off you something as drastic as perhaps suicide, or maybe you're misinterpreting its demand, it's demanding off you radical transformation. It's very easy for your mind to misinterpret that and get caught up with that and see it in the wrong way. And that's, um, that's what I find so interesting about you, what you described. And, and again, it's hard to do that. Often you need like a serious crisis. But the way it came to you was through psychedelics, which is a powerful way to get back in touch with this. So maybe tell me a bit about that. Um, yeah, so, so the whole thing went for a while. The depressed face, uh, thinking about suicide. Um, and at some point, uh, I visited my brother who was studying in Gro Groningen in the Netherlands. Mm -hmm. um, and as is usual there, you can easily get in contact with uh, psychic substances. Um, so we took some, um, and maybe this is the point where I could, should uh, yes, start actually shows the, the presentation. Yeah, wait a second. Give us a look there. So fantastic just a very quick uh, one so this was before the trip some of the things um and could, I, could i ask a brief question like what what did you think of your art at this point and how were you how were you trying to do art at this point and what did you think of yourself at this point what was going on there um the art i was doing the art because i this was one thing i was kind of good at and that was basically uh, the the whole reason i think some of the themes you can find here um are also found in later points and uh, what, what you just noticed uh, or noted the point about um, suicide being a radical form of transformation maybe or self transcendence. Mm -hmm. um, and this was a theme that I've also found already here. You, you can see like the butterfly, mm. a new, uh, new oh, being yeah. emerging out of the old one. And that was actually my 
kind of thinking pattern at the time. Uh, I didn't know I was unhappy in at the at this point in time. Um, and I've had this idea about transformation and stuff, but I never really um, applied them to myself. Um, and so the thought about suicide probably was a natural extension of that. So that's really interesting. So you, 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 that, that's actually, so am I getting this correct? You sort of were a little bit fascinated about the idea of transformation. We'll say the butterfly in your art, but you never actually applied that idea to your, yourself. Yes, pr- pretty much. Yeah. So, so you would like, like, kind of get into uh, you, you know, just get into drawing a butterfly or something like this. But you never think to yourself, "I should transform." There's something wrong with me. That's that's really interesting. Holy shit! Yeah. So this this was before the trip, and basically the the main point is maybe that the art felt uh, kind of empty. So I did it because I tried to do something which was kind of cool um but nothing more there wasn't really mm, a lot of feelings in there um and then this thing happened which was the the, so the trip uh, was we took some substances uh, hawaiian baby woodrose seeds was the the one uh the the specific one and uh, at the time the the trip went for like eight hours and i couldn't do anything else but draw this thing uh, which is totally messy, um, but I couldn't think about anything else at the time. So I actually had to remind myself every few hours to go drink something or take a piss because my <laughs> brain was totally focused on the thing um, and I felt like I was actually communicating with it. I, I talked oh, in shit. a language that I didn't know I don't, and uh, it felt like this was communicating with me. Um, what what was the wait what 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 was the language that you didn't know was it like dutch or something what was going on no 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 no, no, no. it it wasn't it wasn't any real language it was just me making strange sounds uh, and yeah feeling like it kind of correlated with the painting or the drawing yeah that's yeah that's that's quite interesting that's most certainly interesting like i I wonder this this is where things get a little bit kind of like uh eerie and whatnot like i wonder is that uh you know you're you're digging down into maybe a really dense hard hard repressed emotion or something like that and you're actually confronting it for the first time and you're sort of like on a very primal level like talking to yourself and saying this is what I feel, this is what I am and all these type of things. Like there, there could be that side of it. And then on the other hand, you're kind of wondering, it's like, am I, am I sort of tuning into a certain, a certain dimension or something like that? These, these things are uh, interesting and confusing, especially with the, the introduction of chemicals as well. So um, we'll, we'll leave that to, to the boy I was to decide and let's keep on ripping into it and show, show us how this progressed. Yeah, so, uh, and after the trip, that was actually the point. The next day, I've had a little bit of a psych breakdown. Um, which I felt totally devastated. Uh, I cried for hours uh, at a time. Um, And that was actually the first time where I kind of noticed how unhappy I was with my life, Um, which also was the point uh, where I started to change something. Mm -hmm. So this is basically the one most important changing point I've had so far in my life. Um, and the trip kind of triggered something uh, with my creativity. So it flipped the switch. Um, and you can see here all this, this detail. Or it's not really details, but this messiness, this randomness kind of, or not controlled drawing um, is a pattern that uh, yeah, stayed with me from, from that time on. Um, so, and after, after the trip, uh, a lot of other paintings and drawings started. Mm-hmm. Um, this is something that actually also took place during a, a trip. Uh, I took LSD at that time uh, and painted this thing. Um, so also without any, th- any thought going into it, uh, it just emerged. The painting emerged on the canvas. And- so, so uh, what? Like another thing that we're gonna we're gonna start talking about, I'm sure, is colors. So, what is kind of interesting is the, the 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 colors you use are sort of drab purplish grays, 
and then a really, really strong, almost like passionate blood red or something like that. Um, and what, like, for example, when you told me this, you didn't first, you didn't show me the, the painting of the, the trip. And I actually imagined it to be dark black, you know, I was just going for the cliche in my mind. I was like, oh, this will be a dark painting. But it actually was red, which kind of confused me a bit. And um, so I was wondering what you think about that. Like, why red? What was going on with the red? What's, what's, what's all this redness, man? Like, what's going on here? That's, that's a good question. I don't know. So maybe, um, I mean, red is kind of uh, a color for hell. Uh, and actually this painting here, the, the first one, I didn't give a name, but this one I called the second step to hell. Mm -hmm. because it felt like a continuation of the first one. Mm -hmm. um, and Red always has a very deep emotional uh, kind of feeling for me. Oh, that's, mm -hmm. it's, it's very raw. Raw emotions is basically what Red um, means for me. Mm -hmm. and very interesting. Very interesting. All right. All right. Yeah. So, um, and then the... Uh, it, it continued with a lot of, so these are drawings, uh, some I edit, um, which all always have these very intricate patterns and they mm -hmm. all kind of uh, were created the same way. So having a blank page, starting at some point, not having any idea what to do. And then uh, as time went by, uh, a figure emerged. Mm. Um, and something that is pretty obvious to me when I look at them is that they are all very lonely. So they're uh, very solemn creatures. Um, that's, um, that's something we can definitely talk about. I just want to make two notes first before we get into it. So what you're saying is that when you went for that trip, you, you did the chaotic thing and you described it as messy, but you're sort of suggesting that like the messiness was actually a key going forward. And now we're starting to see it manifest where you have like, like this is beautiful. You know, you have this really sophisticated, detailed orientated stuff. And it's sort of a, the style is actually informed by that chaos that appears in that really red painting a while ago, which is fascinating fascinating when you think about it so it's almost like when you opened up that back of the mind the deep mind and let the chaos out and um, it, it gave you this new way of doing things that that had this supreme order to it that you didn't have before and um and i guess another thing i want to ask is um so this this was all you just running off your gut because this looks an awful lot like a the, a polish painter called i can't pronounce oh, yeah. it Zizla or something like that yeah 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 sure this, he was definitely a huge inspiration for me i've looked into him before um yeah it's it's as like this is as beautiful as that like it's it's brilliant i i really really like it and it's a brilliant style and i guess um that that's what i'm i'm asking is uh so so and then never mind about that but we're really interesting about the chaos thing and moving into this becoming more ordered and and he the reason why i brought him up is because he reminded me of someone who he, when you look at his stuff you can tell that it's really like him digging into something incredibly profound and deep and scary and uh, this has this same thing and has this authentic feeling that you're digging into something so i guess this is the question about the loneliness thing like what, what do you mean by that like what was going on there um i've always felt pretty dis pretty disconnected from other people which was before the trip and after the trip it's continued for a long time um and i've had this feeling of or this idea of me being kind of an invisible man so other other people could influence me um, but i couldn't actually have an influence on other people um, and I never felt, I, f I believe it was because I uh, focused on the differences between me and other people and not on the similarities. So I've always uh, saw myself as very different from other um, people, which I guess uh, is the cause for this solitude that you mm. see here. And what do you mean you can't influence other people as in like when you speak to them, you can't seem to move them or what? Yeah, was a, I, I've always been a very, um, very introverted person. Um, so this was, I've actually never really talked much mm. till, I, till like 2022, 20, something like this. Um, and I've always waited for other people to engage me. I never, I never actively went into the world. I've just... Uh, saw what happened to me and this was kind of the the feeling that I got for and at the time that I was like this basically invisible person I could mm. 
or you, you could maybe see it like a character in a video game that can do things in the game, but not actually influence the other characters. Mm. Wow, so that's really can, yeah, yeah, that's that's really interesting, man. That's really interesting. Um, okay, cool. Keep, keep going there. Keep going. Yes, um, and then at some point the gazing started, um, which is the the people or the the characters in the paintings actually intensely stare at something. Before it was like they were kind of lost in the place uh, and now they find something which they can concentrate on and focus mm -hmm. on. Um, also, you notice the colors get a little bit brighter or not as, uh, as dark as before, mm -hmm. not as gritty looking. Um, and so this theme of actually looking at, uh, at an object that has a kind of transcendent uh, yeah, it, it transcendence to it um, is something that started at some point and continued or does still continue. Um, and this one is a painting. Where, so the, the colors were always a huge deal for me. Mm -hmm. um, I've painted, when I started painting, it was the reds and blacks. Uh, then blues entered the scene. At some points, yellow came in. Uh, and this one was the first one where I actually painted with purple. Uh, it was also the first big painting I did. The other ones before were always small. Mm -hmm. um, and this was larger. And it actually coincided with me uh, having my first contact with the feminine. So <laughs> I had my first kiss at the, at the time. Um, and I guess this kind of triggered this this side of, of my emotions. So some parts that were locked before, um, yeah. the colors I didn't use uh, became became used. And this was the purple. That's amazing. That's just so interesting. And the thing I love about this is that you, when you were describing them, this to me first, like you're sort of psychoanalyzing these now, if you will. You're looking back through them now and being like, all right, that's, there's the art pieces that have been happening. Oh, that's what was going on here. But at the time, there was none of, you weren't like saying, all right, I've had my first kiss. I'll use some purple. Like it wasn't <laughs> like that at all. You were saying that a lot of this was very, very much you just going with the flow and letting, almost allowing yourself to be led and it's only now that you're looking back and seeing these things. Am I correct in, in that? Yeah, absolutely. So actually, I only started to look back on the paintings um, as more than just uh, things that... Uh, before, I thought they didn't have any meaning to them. Mm. It was just like, yeah, me getting some kind of vibe that I was, uh, that I was bringing into the world, but nothing that was connected to me was kind of apart from me mm -hmm. um, and when I first got got into Jung which is I, I've got a painting somewhere later in the slide slideshow um, and that was the point when I actually looked back uh, at the old paintings and uh, tried to find patterns um, that kind of correlated with the changes I went through at the time. And so this is a really really interesting thing because there's this sort of interaction between um, the art and the world and then when you do things in the world like in the video game if you will when you do various things it 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 influences the art in some sense and um, did you ever find an inverse thing like was there was is there a sort of communication going on or is it one way like when you, you have the first kiss does then the art change or was it ever something where you felt that that the art was suggesting you to you to do something or maybe maybe that's not the right way to say it. was there ever a mood that ended up in a painting that actually and t turned out to be extremely useful in your life as well. Um, I believe it goes both ways, actually. So it can be that that. So I think it's uh, it's like um, working with the theme. So um, mm. first, the first time me finding some kind of this uh, romantic feelings or or desires, stuff like this. Um, and those had to be worked through. I couldn't just like take them in just mm -hmm. like this. Um, and so the painting had to be created to, um, yeah, to, to get through this. But the other way around also works. If I, if I have some theme that is hidden inside of me um, and the art breaks it free or uh, creates some place for it, then I can later act it out in the world. Mm, interesting. Really interesting. Really interesting. <clears throat> okay, cool, sir. Keep going, man. Yes. So this one was 
also one of these the, the staring at an at another object. So here we have a character, um, and this is supposed to be kind of a mirror, but into another world. So another uh, version of this this uh, character here. Um, and what I've always found fascinating was the wall which he's standing before. I'm not quite sure what it means, but I probably it's something like um, the transformation that could take place, but there's something um, something that's preventing it from happening right now. And do you remember anything from your life at that time that was that would be representative, or what, like what blocks do you remember in these type of things? Um, this was me trying to, yeah, pretty much this, this was the heavy transformation phase where I started to read books, self-help things, stuff like this. Um, I started to train heavily, um, get into shape. Um, and yeah, that's, that's basically that, that time. Uh, so this was something as I, uh, titled the, the slideshow, Navigating Through Life Via Art. Um, this is something that also uh, happened or something that I started to do was doing little birthday presents or drawings for friends, mm -hmm. um, trying to kind of catch their character and put it into a painting or drawing. Um, so it wasn't only trying to understand myself through art, but also understanding other people and the world through art. Mm -hmm. So this is one of these. Um, and this was the first one where, I've, where I was really proud of, or that, was, that I was really proud of. Um, this is, a, yeah, thank you. This is, this is something that uh, a pattern started at that point, which was having one idea, so uh, a true thought about uh, the or theme for the painting. Um, starting the painting and then playing around till I found the or till it felt right. Um, and here the green got introduced, which I didn't like at all before. I never painted with green. I've noticed, yeah, that's, that's a re like, that is just so, in you're, you're talking to an Irishman, by the way, so I'm extremely offended, first of all, <laughs> but, um, but that is, that is so interesting, yeah, and that the green gets introduced, and, and you were describing a sort of energy that came out of that, and this is also a sort of apotheosis moment, in some sense, when you're like, I made it, so tell me, tell me a bit about that. Um, yeah, so the green, I guess, is, uh, at that point, I felt a lot more alive than ever before. So things started to work out and I started to feel like I belonged in the world a lot more. Um, and the green was probably on one point nature, a better connection to nature mm -hmm. um, and the uh, vitality. Mm. So actually the life force that I felt mm -hmm. uh, at the time um, and which you can he see here is the gazing also, um, which is something that I believe has to do with actually myself looking at these paintings when uh, so when I'm painting one of these one of the big ones um, I'm in a flow state mm -hmm. so I'm not thinking much and time runs by and things just happen um, but actually the most intense moment is afterwards when I step back from the painting um, and look at them and I'm totally in awe because I've got no idea how the fuck this just happened and <laughs> how, how this thing got I don't know, it just appeared, uh, yeah. appeared uh, before me. Um, and mm -hmm. yeah, yes. so, so really awestruck kind of. Um, and is there any relationship to that, that experience you had when you're drawing the red picture and it felt like you were talking to the painting? Like, is there, is there some type of vibe with that as well? Like what, what's going on there? Yeah, pro probably like now that you mentioned it, um, the, the, talking or the connection um, with these paintings is something that I've also f already, uh, always felt the need to do. So after I painted one of these huge pictures, um, I often had to look at them. So when, when I was trying to sleep, I had to stand up, turn on the light and look at them for a while <laughs> um, to actually feel content. And then I could go back to sleep. So they were always on my mind. Um, well, that's so interesting. So, so they, they, would, they would bring a sort of 
peace to you in some sense. That's, yes. You know, and I, this is like, I know it's kind of funny because I, I don't say this too much because it sounds like incredibly arrogant, but I have the same thing with my music from time to time where it's like, I'll just listen to the song on repeat and it, it really relaxes me for some reason in a way that other music can't. I don't know how to describe it. And um, yeah, there's, there's something about that where you kind of just need to do it for some reason. And it's like... Um, God, that, that's a really good point. I don't know what to make of that, but it is. It's, it's, I'd listen to the song and uh, you're, you're feeling like you just understand and everything's in its right place and there's an order to the world in that little moment and you're there caught with it and you're fine. Yeah, I absolutely get that. I'm, I mean, I guess you probably, if you look at other art, you can find themes that kind of fit to your situation, but at, with your own art, it's always the, exactly that theme yeah. where you're at right now. Yeah, so it's yeah. always exactly fitting. So I guess that could probably explain it. And it's it's interesting that one day I was just um, walking past the bookshop down to a bus and I was sitting down waiting for the bus. And I remember having this like blindingly like searing flash of the meaning of art. And I, you know, I'm always walking around thinking, so I don't make, make much, I don't make much of these like visions I have or anything like this, because I'm always thinking in this type of way. Like I'd be walking down the street and I'd be like imagining stuff. And uh, I sound like an absolute crazy bastard, by the way, when I describe myself that way. But I was walking down and I had this vision that um, art is sort of like uh, photographs, like an Instagram uh, page for someone's soul. And so when you get that, you're actually seeing their journey. And the whole problem I was doing with my artistic career is that I was trying to present the perfect finished soul at the end, but no one is interested in that. People want to see the flashes as you're on your way towards whatever you're going towards. And what's interesting is that your soul is never going to be complete. There's never going to be apotheosis. That's never going to happen in the sense that like, all right, here's my perfect soul. It's that you can only let out droplets of it. And it's, it's, it's like, um, you know, it's only ever perfect in that moment, that type of thing. And um, I remember seeing that and understanding that. And it really kind of clicked in the sense that I was like, that's, that's the that's really what it is all about it's about seeing flashes it's about getting glimpses never understanding completeness it's not about completeness it's about more of a, a flowy way of understanding things and you're getting like photographs of someone's life and the the completion of the picture is when you like you know look at the circle at the very very end you know long after they're gone in some sense and even after they're gone you can still imply things people could finish like Nietzsche is a great example you can sort of see where he would have gone but you've got to kind of glimpse at his soul for that period and that's why he just stands you know titanic on the on the top of the mountain of the western canon and we all sort of react to him because he is just the the, the he just put so he just released such a profound energy through himself and it's the same with stuff like this and and then that makes perfect sense when you're sitting there and you, you're you're listening to your music or staring at your own art you're you're um you're entrancing you're speaking oh man it's so hard to describe you're you're sort of experiencing your, your a moment in time when you were closest to your soul or something like this it's always also the the feeling of um finding something that is bigger than than life or bigger than yeah. this material yeah. world we live in mm. actually i believe if i had didn't have my arts i'd probably be dead right now um <laughs> or if not <laughs> no it's it's fine or if not i'd be totally depressed yeah. because this is actually how i redeem myself or how i redeem this world yeah, because there's yeah. so much shit going on um and if you don't find some way to to free yourself um i guess you get destroyed by it oh god man I, i'm i'm so nietzsche filled um, these days and, and that's one thing that he talks about that is so uh so brilliant where he, he almost says the he calls it the tyrannical artist in some sense and that's where um you'll get this think of the romantic poet from the 19th century and he climbs up on top of the mountain and looks across the fog like your your staring character like your staring character and he looks across the fog and he says um he says this world has fallen and, and i'm going to impose my my images upon it and, and redeem it i'm going to i'm going to make it worthwhile i'm going to make it better it's almost like uh th the most difficult thing to understand about life is that in some sense we give it meaning we impose our reality upon it like what like man is the thing that imp imposes creates beauty it's a really weird idea but it's it's a very very profound one the more you think about it is that the the, the existential state of of almost all people is actually living in a very unideal fallen world and and artists go into whatever the fuck this place is and they find this inner voice that 
shapes things like this for them. And they go into these trances and bring this stuff out. And this actually gives them something beautiful to reach for that doesn't exist. And they've now brought it into existence. And it sort of shows that we, in some sense, are one of the key components towards making this world better. And maybe that's God we're letting rush through our heads or something like that. But regardless, like we're, we're a fundamental functional part of the redemptive energy of the world. And then, um, and yeah, well, there, there's, there's just an interesting thought. Let's put it that way. Um, sorry, dude, keep going before I just meet you. Hey. <laughs> but that was beautiful. So we'll continue. <laughs> um, this one was one where the first one we have actually drawn more than one character. Um, and at the time I felt uh, that was basically pretty much the time where I stopped um, focusing on the differences between me and other people and started to look more at the, uh, at the similarities. Yeah. So where I actually got my first real or more, much more honest connections to other people where I started to show vulnerabilities and um, yeah, got really in touch with other, uh, other people. So. This is, what's so interesting about this is um, the aesthetic quality of this is, is like so high now at this point. Like the ones at the start, they were decent. Uh, you clearly had like skill, but, but now just even your sense of color here is just so good. It just so, it sticks out to me. I have a sort of sense of this stuff as well. I wouldn't, you should see me draw it. It's the worst. It's like a little baby, but um, I can kind of, I love seeing this because it's, it's so well done. Like even the creamy white behind it, that contrasts so well with the gray and the red and all that. Like this is really, really good at this point. So. Thanks. Um, so on we go. Oh it's yeah. Fun. This and yep. this this is such a good painting, boy. I'm so excited to show this. This <laughs> this fiend has got some great paintings. Look at this. Come on, sorry, sir. <laughs> so this one was at, at the start. I actually wanted to show something pretty dark. Um, the idea was basically to have the thing in the back here be a lighthouse, um, and the people trying to reach the lighthouse but drowning drowning on the way. So kind of the I don't know. Uh, some things that seem to be nice in the world, but actually lead you to, to your downfall. Um, but as I started the painting, my subconscious or some parts of me uh, felt that this wasn't right. So a lot of other stuff happened and this is what got out in the end, um, which to me is like Yggdrasil is what I called this painting. As so, in from, from Norse myth. Yes, yes. So the, the world tree yeah. um, that kind of connects yeah, all the different realms. Um, and most of my paintings actually show me in some way or another. Mm -hmm. um, and so this is the compass. Mm -hmm. um, that is kind of the way I try to navigate through uh, to get to this transcendental place mm -hmm. uh, or yeah just just the way i don't know always trying to to look at what i what i'm trying to achieve or what i'm trying to to find in life uh and this is kind of yeah the painting and th this is this is quite interesting as well because you you mentioned this but we haven't really riffed on it too much is that you begin to um, move away from just being solitude and now you're actually having more than one person in the in the paintings like that's a very very drastic change because before all of them were sort of you and now it's it's you've got you and someone else and you're sort of doing this stuff together so that that's quite interesting change as well and this is this is just uh this reminds me of alex gray like i kind of feel like i'm looking at something that is is um got that similar like very original authentic style but it reminds me of uh the same type of almost like the way he's exploring. It's the same with his Ladzla or whatever his name is. You're, you're sort of exploring a part of your mind and it's bringing stuff like this back to you. And it, it sort of looks like you're, you're going to similar places, if you know what I mean, but com coming back with completely original stuff, but still seeing something, um, still, still be, going to the same crazy deep caverns of the mind and all this stuff. It's a, a very interesting form of art because I'm not sure. I think a lot of people in the psychedelic sphere and all that, they, they maybe try to make, art but they they oh they make it too psychedelic whereas this seems a lot more like you're um actually just rolling with what your mind is telling you to do which is brilliant so just yeah thought. I've, I've thought about this like um each artist has a different uh language for, yeah. so we we actually often describe the the same basic pattern 
um, or similar similar themes, but uh, the language, uh, each one has a unique language, um, which also holds a big part of uh, of the value of the piece. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, that's like almost all the ecstasy is, is sort of in the, the um, it's hard to describe, just in, in the, the uniqueness of it in some sense, even though you could, you know, like um, you read Dante's Inferno and there's, I think there's like four or five different artists who painted Dante's Inferno. Blake is one. I believe there's like three or four others. And all of them are gorgeous to look at because they're all coming at it from their own unique angle. But it's all about the exact same story, you know? Mm-hmm. So it's, um, it's interesting stuff, yeah, most certainly. Okay, so on we go. This is actually the painting where I started to get into Jung. Nice. Um, this is really big, so a lot of detail is lost on this little screen. But um, So basically, the main thing happening here is uh, right there, which is the character at the top uh, getting down the sta- staircase can you so the, this is like four feet I, four feet I don't tall isn't know it? if i can wait a second what's this new loudon mad <laughs> yeah, that that's german is this is um, this all odin nope. magic spells or something sorry go back yes, to it there. Yes, just runes um no i don't think i can actually okay okay no worries Get, roll um, with it there anyway sir roll yeah I, I try to try to do it like this so there's this little character which is me trying to get down the staircase uh, everything at the top is the conscious world mm-hmm. and everything at the bottom is the subconscious or unconscious world mm-hmm. um and so this is me and mirrored but uh, distorted is the shadow down here so basically the the main idea of the painting was me trying to get closer to to the shadow um and what's, so what's the big black sun at the bottom yeah that's that's the very very deep unconscious the, the, mm-hmm. the, the idea behind that was so here is the part of the subconscious that you can actually integrate oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. um and the deeper it goes so this is something that we could never know the black hole it's supposed to be like a black hole because it's so far from us and uh, we could never actually reach it and we cannot look inside. Mm-hmm. So there, are al- there will always be parts that we will never be able to know. Um, and what was interesting about this painting, uh, so one thing, this was, as I said, the painting where I started to look back at my other stuff. So this is kind of a look at the journey so far. Um, and there are these jellyfishes with different colors. Um, yeah, yeah, I noticed. That's actually a theme in the older ones, isn't it? Yeah. Yes, yes, yeah. The jellyfish are definitely a theme. And um, with the colors, it's um, they are breaking out of the subconscious. So as I, as I picture it, it's, it's um, these jellyfishes are emotions that are, or ideas that are not yet in my conscious thought. So they break out of the subconscious they swim to the top and when they when when they reach the surface um they explode and bring their color into the world so we can see here the green is coming in and the purple is coming in um and yeah so they are enriching the world and something that you might find interesting uh at the bottom of the staircase here there are two statues so the right one is the the fool um, these also, I didn't plan them. They just happened. Um, interesting. Oh, so this is sort of you just, just drawing stuff that felt right. That's again, yes, that's yes. so interesting. So, so in this picture, some things were planned. The, the jellyfishes, I thought about what I wanted to, to show and it was mostly the jellyfishes and the shadow. Mm-hmm. Um, but these, for example, came just to be with the time because also these paintings they take some months to finish so it's not Mm -hmm. like i'm i'm having an idea and i'm pushing it through uh but it takes some time and it evolves as i as i do um and so here on the left is the wise old man um and on the right is the fool Mm -hmm. so these for, for me were like or when i look at them it's um the two sides that i find very strongly in myself Mm -hmm. probably most people have them um but the idea here was that the fool is the one that's playing around um always very natural and open um and who's in life pretty much um Mm -hmm. and already also um 
the one that's able or willing to fail mm -hmm. because he doesn't care about it very much. And on the other side, there's the wise man, which is the um, the one to to know things, mm -hmm. trying to understand the world. Um, and so these two basic characters, um, which I found inside of myself. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, um, this is an amazing painting as well. It's way bigger. It's like a couple of feet long and tall. And it's, um, it's incredible, the detail when you see it up close. Like it's, it's so well done. So that's super interesting. And what, what happens next then? I saw, did you go back into drawing? Uh, yeah, I, I've always been drawing in between. So it never stopped. I just picked some some of my works because taking all of them would totally uh not fit in in a presentation um so this this one was uh which was pretty interesting it started after the the carl jung or the the after i got into jung mm -hmm. um and i started to uh, write stories and this one was the first um and i drew it and at some point in the drawing process, I thought, what is this character doing there? Um, and I wrote a story about it, which also came to me mostly uh, from the subconscious. So I didn't thought about it. I, I just thought, no, this, this character looks interesting. What's he doing? Um, and then a story poured out of me on the paper. Um, yeah, which which was quite a fascinating thing to do because I didn't know before that 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 was something inside of me. I thought I only had the visual aspect of it, um, but there was also the storytelling yes. aspect. Renaissance man style. <laughs> and so then it went on. Um, this is a kind of recent painting. Um, so, so is this, by the way, is this digital or is this traditional? No, this is traditional. Oh, dude, that is so well done. Like the the details. If, if you've nice pecs by the way as well if this is a self-portrait you've been yes it is it is <laughs> yeah that's Thanks. it that's, that's good that's good work in the gym it seems like that training for that uh, elaborate elaborate ritual yeah. did you well yeah it, it worked out <laughs> uh, different than i had planned but uh, i'm pretty pretty happy that it did <laughs> um so yeah this was the first self-portrait i uh, intended to do so or yeah, so, um, and the idea behind this is that uh, the, I've opened myself up more and more over the years to other people yeah. and to myself as well. Um, at the beginning of the journey, after the trip, I didn't know a whole lot about myself. I knew that I wanted to work, I was disciplined, I had some willpower, but I didn't actually know myself um, and I try to do that more and more and open myself up to other people. And this is the process of that. Yeah. Um, so the idea behind this is basically the po before there's, there's this hole inside the chest. Mm -hmm. um, and before the hands uh, covered it completely. Mm -hmm. um, and so this is the process of the hands um, uncovering, yeah. Un yeah. uncovering it, yes, and sort of showing the the beauty that's inside um but that, also the the vulnerability and that that's amazing because that um that flower well i was just going to comment aesthetically like how did you get it to glow i, I just don't understand because this, if this is a painting how did you get it to get that glowing thing like that's brilliant man what the hell is going on here it looks actually, uh it's it's the contrast so actually that's that's the whole magic trick behind this thing it, yeah. it, it actually those aren't strong colors at all uh, these, right here these are these are like, this sounds green. like odinism if you ask me man this is what's <laughs> going on over here <laughs> so, so those are like green and grays um and pretty bright bright grays um but due to the fact that all of the rest of the color is uh, in these brownish tones it really pops out yeah absolutely so, that's that's just so well done it's, it's brilliant Thanks. that's a that's an amazing painting i thought that was digital and now that i know it's painting it's even better like that's crazy and um, yeah so that's 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 really interesting psychologically as well as that opening up and then the delicate flower coming out and i, I assume this is all stone that you're made of otherwise. yes yeah that's also part of the uh, the idea behind the painting so um what i felt like um the, the flower also grew uh, by the fact that um I went through some hardships and some struggles, which uh, kind of burned the body, and I had to 
had yeah, to close my heart uh, at some point. But uh, the idea behind that was also that um, when something burns, uh, you create ash. And uh, or yeah. what's, I, I believe that's the English name, ash. Uh, and it is a very good, um, oh, what's the name for that? Fertilizer. Something that, yeah, fertilizer. That's fertilizer. it. That, that's it. what I was looking for. <laughs> so, yes, interesting stuff, yeah. dude. And uh, where, um, where do we go from here? What happens next? Yes. So I started to get digital into digital painting at the, I don't know, start of this year, something like this. Um, and this is also one of these things where I've had a certain theme that I wanted to tackle. And this painting is kind of a meditation on the, this theme. So this is one where it's a lot more planned than most of my paintings are. Mm -hmm. Um, but also a lot of stuff happened in between. Mm -hmm. But you can see that it's not as intricate as most of the other things. There isn't as much uh, psychedelic stuff going on. Um, which So I, I sometimes breach out from my normal way of doing mm -hmm. paintings. Um, and this was a meditation on death. Mm -hmm. So on, and uh, yeah, kind of the, the, what's the name? Varitas, I think. I'm not too sure. Not too sure. Uh, so, so those is those are kinds of painting that um, uh, reflect on on death and um, how death actually or oh, what's the name for that um, that things end actually make them beautiful or valuable or more valuable. Oh, this I, I don't I don't think. See, you Germans, you have uh, this ability to conceptualize things with your language that the English can't. Uh, the Anglos can't, I should say. The Irish, I'm sure, are brilliant at this. So you might actually have a word for this that we don't have. Like you would have um, Wanderlust, for example. We, 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 don't, we actually steal that word from you because we don't have a conception for that, that feeling. Like we just can't describe it. We'd maybe call it, I don't know, um, nostalgia or something like that. But we just, we can't conceptualize that. Whereas you have a brilliant ability to do all that type of stuff. I think you, you say something about Laban's, craft or Laban's uh, life art or something like that. That's, that's another one that's brilliant as well. So I don't know, I don't know what you might describe this. I'd call it maybe apotheosis, which is the completion idea, but I'm not sure if that's the right idea because that means become God, which is not quite the same thing as what you're describing, <laughs> which is the completion upon death. Yeah. Mm. Um, yeah. So, so probably fr fragility could be a, uh, in German, we have Vergänglichkeit. I don't think there's a word for this in English. Um, but fragility is kind of coming close to so things that uh, due to the fact that things end and that we die we can actually find a lot of beauty in that or mm -hmm. value uh, which we can uh, then transport into life and uh, are able to to value life more or the things that we have mm -hmm. um so this yeah this was one of these paintings that uh, i did Beautiful. to reflect on a theme and this is the one i'm working at right now uh, which is also very much this. Um, also, again, I've had this idea of trying to breach out from the path that I went so far. Um, yeah. Uh, there's loads of things I'd like to comment on this. The first one, of course, is um, down here you've got a harp, I believe. And a uh, harp is obviously the symbol of Ireland. So I'm assuming this is your, uh, your, your subtle confession of fidelity to the Irish cause. I, I assume that's what's going on here. Yeah, that's a secret laugh that I did. Uh, all right, no, I see. I see. All right, noted. I'll put you on the list of people who will uh, survive in the, new, in the new Irish world order. That's, that's <laughs> what we'll go down. Um, but obviously, this is, this is a fascinating one because it's, it's got like three characters and they're very, shall we shall we use the jargon? They're very archetypical. You know, you've got the almost like Eastern goddess with her many, many arms and whatnot. And then, then you have the, 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 the playful divine like child popping out of you as well. And then you have yourself in your suit of armor. And it's funny how you, um, you describe yourself as sort of an introvert, but then you, also, like you, you have this suit of armor type um, conceptualization of yourself that shows up a lot, even you covered in stone. And then you have that little flower inside you. And then I, I assume that's somewhat rel related to this concept of the child that's jumping out. So any comments on that before? Yeah, that's, that's also like the, the thought of being, letting out the vulnerable parts. So I've, I guess maybe that's also a theme that, uh, that can be seen through the whole journey. Um, so before the trip and before I noted how unhappy I was, um, or 
more, more likely uh, after that i try i try to uh create a suit of armor for me so to i did sport i tried to learn new skills uh but uh, that was all in the outside world mm -hmm. so i created a piece of armor outside of me um, and at some point i started to also look inside and actually see the the little child in me the the vulnerable uh little thing that's can actually be heard pretty easily um, and try to give it its space. Oh, that's what I'm at right now. That's it's so interesting just in terms of the, the psychology of all that stuff and that, you know, um, go, going for the hustle porn and, and, you know, working your ass off and doing all the reps in the gym and all that stuff. Like it's actually really important stuff. It's, it's essential. Um, but at the same time, there, there is absolutely what you're describing there is like you're building a suit of armor and, um, it's weird. You, you got to be careful with that because as Nietzsche said, the maturity of a man is reached when he finds the seriousness of a child at play. And that's often the, the very classic story is that like I became an adult, I became all serious, hard suit of armor, like masculine frame and all this stuff. And the inner child died off. And then what you see in old people when they sort of stop caring about competing for status or safety and all this stuff is that they, they, they developed a little, childlike glint in their eyes you know the kind of funny granddad type archetype i guess is what the wise old man is is sort of like a an old guy who realizes that he, he is just a kid in the scheme of things like he just doesn't like he, he's he's fresh faced and whatnot and then um, i guess what 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 ties with that often is the 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 feeling of bravery it's, it's actually really weird is that you know the suit of armor is actually the, the declaration of fear you know, it's like I'm trying to protect myself, but the child is curious and brave and bombastic and he tries things out and he goes crazy and he lets, lets himself search. And it seems like you're pretty good at that, but maybe this is one of those things where it's like, I wonder if you can start pushing that out into the, into the real world and see what's going on there as well and start to expand yourself out there and see how your, where your energies bring and whatnot out there. And it could be like that, that could be a very, very interesting psychological side of this stuff. Who knows? That, that could be something that's going on. And what's so interesting about this series is seeing you go through this progress and um, or this process, I should say, and uh, watching these various patterns form up and, and, and drift out and change and all this stuff. Um, so, yeah, dude, that, that's absolutely amazing. That whole series is absolutely amazing. I'm also noticing more jellyfish here, so I don't know what's going on there. <laughs> But that, that could be like a boyo is one jellyfish and alert might be the other right thing. <laughs> yeah, that, that could be it. Okay. Probably. Fantastic. Well, fantastic. Well, if you have any last thoughts uh, before we wrap it up and then we, we can talk a little bit about um, um, maybe possibly art stores and whatnot. So, um, yeah. So I just, just a reminder. So this is, um, as I see it, it's, this is one way uh, that I'm looking at, at my story or my, journey through uh through art um so i there are a lot of more a lot more subtleties in there uh mm. and a lot of yeah a lot of breaches out of that um but this is like the general theme that i found mm -hmm. or one of one of the general themes that i found in my art yeah yeah, it's so interesting. So, so, so interesting. And absolutely, there's like a vista of more stuff. Like it's, it's one of those things that you couldn't explain it. And even if you could, you'd probably destroy it through explaining it. But it's better to just sort of see the all. But um, even more to reinforce the point that this stuff is, has something to it. It's, it's far, it's, it's definitely not trivial. Let's put it that way. And then um, to do it right, you almost can't go in with an intention to, to try do it right. You sort of have to let it lead you in some sense. And, and so um, that's, I guess that's the message to all the artist boils out there. If they're ever struggling with this stuff or, if, or even, even if you're um, just a normal dude or a normal boyette and you don't think you're that artistic, it's always very, very interesting to start looking at your imaginative mind and seeing the way it's interpreting your problems. I always try to get people to visualize their emotions because that actually becomes a very, very inter interesting way to interact with them. It's easier to understand what's happening with you when you can see it versus when it's just a chatter brain thought in your head. You know now 
on that bombshell. And Malte, and what's probably going to happen a lot with uberboyo.com going forward is we're going to look to, because we've got a, quite a few of these artists, we're going to look to collecting some of this stuff and putting it up there for sale if people want to buy it. Because of course, we want to we want to reach the world. We want to get Malte's memes pressed up against all over your, your Boyo caves or whatever you've got, your Boyo war rooms or your Boyo platforms, whatever you're, wherever you're sitting there, uh, you know, conducting your aircraft carrier from. It'd be very, 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 very powerful if you could uh, get some of this these, these richly deep energies from the collective unconscious littered around your house and whatnot. So we're going to open up a shop on a boyo, uh, uberboyo.com where you'll be able to get this stuff as canvases. And we may look into other stuff as well, but you know, we're, we're trying to keep it a uh, high grade. We don't want to really sell mugs and stuff like this. So we're going to look at doing that, all that stuff over there. So if you're interested in that, definitely pop down to the link in the description. I'll leave it there. Malte will get money for this. This will be um, his way of funding this stuff, I'd imagine. And we, we will start to get this stuff out into the world. And this is like really high quality stuff. Like this is, I've, I've kind of a feeling that uh, this, this guy is going to be known in a, a couple of years, hopefully anyway. And um, this, is, this is one of those moments where you might actually get in early on, on a great artist for all we know. And you know the backstory behind it as well. So it gives it even more juice, you know, it gives it even more power. So if you're interested in that, pop down in the description below. You'll be able to get a canvas, a print of some sort. You'll be able to get it shipped out to you wherever you live. As long as you don't live in England. Sorry, we're going to ban England just for, I don't know why. I just, I just There's my business head coming off me. Oh no, I said too much. So um, so that's everything from myself there. And if you's, uh, if you if you's want to um, get involved with this stuff in any way, this is obviously the way that we like doing things, getting more artistic, more vibey, more uh, intuitive, more floozy, more um, maybe wish-washy, but it, it definitely gets something done when you look at this stuff. So thank you very much for your time, people. Malte, thank you very much for your time. Any last words, I guess, sir? Um, no, that's it. Thank you for doing this. Oh, no problem at all. It was an absolute pleasure. I uh, absolutely love seeing all that stuff. So again, people, thank you very much. Link down in the description. Please check it out. Tell us what you think. And we'll see you later. Bye. Bye. Bye.